Pray, Father, here we thank you for another opportunity to come tonight. We pray as those who listen in, we pray that they will be encouraged, that they will be enlightened, and they will be edified as we come away from your studies tonight. Widely studying your word, rightly divided. We thank you for the gospel, and that is our Lord and Jesus, Savior Jesus Christ, that he died, that he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. We thank you for the good news. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, my brothers and sisters, we're going to go ahead and get our message up uh, for tonight, uh, February the 12th, 2024. And our scripture that we've been referencing is uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. Look at this. Who comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherein we also are comforted of God. Now, when comforting others, we should edify. We should minister grace unto the hurting soul. And how can you edify with no doctrine? And that's the key right there. Sometimes the worst individuals to try and comfort others are those who have no knowledge of God's word and what God is doing. And those who claim they have been saved for many years, but they have no knowledge of the scriptures rightly divided. These are the ones who always feel like they have something to say, but end up making the grieving family of friends or loved ones hurt more. They are the most miserable comforters. Many of these believers are the ones that just snatch and grab scripture out of context. And one of the main passages of scripture that these miserable comforters use when trying to comfort a grieving family of loved ones and friends is the Lord's Prayer. Millions in the body of Christ utter the Our Father Prayer over and over and over and over, completely disregarding its context and breaking the two rules Jesus attached to it, which we will discuss in a few minutes. I encourage anyone listening to carefully study the context of the Lord's Prayer. None of the millions who pray it daily understands its context. I guarantee you. Recall what the Apostle Paul wrote. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding. You see that? I will pray with understanding. So when you're around holding hands with those grieving families and loved ones and uh, friends, you should be praying with understanding. 1 Corinthians 14 and 15. The Our Father prayer is mindless, repeated in public in circumstances that really have nothing to do with its content. Many pray it before they eat. They pray it before they travel. They pray it when they hear heartbreaking news. Many pray it at weddings. They pray it at funerals. They recite it in their assemblies. Many pray it over the phone with others. Let the word of God help someone that need to hear the word of truth right divide. And that is the so-called Lord's Prayer. More aptly, the Our Father Prayer has nothing to do with us in this dispensation of grace. Its contents do not apply to our dispensation. However, the Our Father prayer is very appropriate in Israel's kingdom program. That's why you need to understand what Paul means by rightly dividing the word of truth. Its context. Before Jesus gave them that model prayer, the Our Father prayer, he gave them two rules. Matthew 6, 5 through 8. And he said, and when thou prayest, talking to the, to the nation of Israel, those in the nation of Israel, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may see, be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. He said, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions. You see that as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask them. Firstly, let's look at this. Jesus said they were not to pray like the hypocrites. 
such as the Pharisees during those days, who prayed publicly merely to be seen of others, believing Israel was to pray privately in prayer clauses. That's the way they were supposed to pray. Remember when I used to get up and pray what we called altar call and and I just used to cite vain repetitions over and over again, things I've heard other preachers say. My brothers and sisters, and when thou prayest, he said, thou should not pray as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. You see, Jesus told them not to pray also like the heathen either. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do. For they, they, they that think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Matthew, verse six, Matthew 6, verse 7, 8. These Gentiles, Jesus talking about, said they talk much in prayer because they were trying to get their God's attention. The pagans mildly repeated the same empty words, hoping their much speaking in prayer would result in a divine, divine response. Remember, they were certainly not praying to Israel's God, the God of Scripture. According to the Lord, vain repetitions are what the heathens pray. God wants intelligent prayer with faith, not mindless repetitions of words whose meanings we do not understand. Believing ears are surrounded by the pagan Romans could have easily fallen into the trap of praying like those heathens. Mindless repeating words to gain attention from any deity that would calculate to their petitions. In Matthew 6, 7 to 8, Jesus Christ was very careful in warning Israel, not us in the body of Christ, not to err in that regard. So I asked the question, how we're praying when you look at the Lord's prayer and it says these, these, these uh, verses in it and you see these things said, I want to ask the question tonight, how, my brothers and sisters, how we're praying, give us this day our daily bread, help a grieving family, loved ones, and friends. Now, how, how standing there holding a grieving family, loved ones, and friends' hand, and you repeating the Lord's prayer saying, give us this day our daily bread, Lord. Many folks' pantries are full of food. So how is that, how is that those, those uh, words going to encourage and uplift this family? Or these loved ones and friends. What, what in saying, give us this day our daily bread will bring comfort to those grieving. They need words that would bring tranquility to their soul and build them up in their inner man. Now the question, here goes some more of the Lord's Prayer. What is saying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil going to do for that grieving family, loved ones, a friend, soul that needs words of comfort? What about, and forgive us our debts if we give our debtors as you stand there holding their hand? The Our Father prayer mentioned three main needs of Israel, not us. Material blessings, particularly food, dealing with Israel, they was the ones that received manna from heaven. Forgiveness and deliverance from Satan's world system into Christ's Christ kingdom. Jesus so clearly declared, for your father know what things you have in need of before you asked him. The Our Father prayers is a way of asking Jehovah for things he already said he would give them anyway. Thus, it is senseless for us Gentiles to pray it in the dispensation of grace and try to use it to comfort others as well as ourselves. This is how religious people conduct themselves. And those who are carnal, who have no knowledge of God's word and what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace. They have no doctrine in their inner man. Religious believers and saints, they just go through the motions week after week. Acts 20 and 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. This specifically talks about members of the church, the body of Christ, assembling for fellowship and Bible study. I'm going somewhere here. Paul's instruction to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13 are, till I come, 
give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. As grace believers who understand what is God doing today in this dispensation of grace, we go to church, my brothers and sisters, to fellowship with God's people, 1 Corinthians 11, 33, to study the Holy Bible, 1 Timothy 4, 13, and 15, 16, not to gain God's blessings. We already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Read Ephesians 1, 3, not to be entertained. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, talking about the tickling ear messages that people hear. Not to keep the Sabbath, Colossians 2, 16, not to obtain salvation, Titus 3, 5. Not to be in God's presence or in the house. Read 2 Corinthians 16. We are, we are the temple of God, not a building. According to Paul's epistles, going to church is not assembling in some million dollar auditorium where wheelbarrows are pushed around and all big types of collection plates. Neither is church a place where we go to feel emotional high and enjoy ear-tickling motivational messages or sermons. Nor is church a time when we crank up loud music in order to appeal to the world. Yes, that is today's average so-called Bible-believing church. But God's definition is otherwise. But many who tend many of these denominations are not receiving the word of truth right divided, we saints in the body of Christ are not assembling to feel religious, but rather to be reminded of God's life in us. We saints are not assembling to be entertained, but rather to be edified by God's word rightly divided. We saints are not assembling to fill our minds with complex denominational doctrines, but rather to fill our hearts with the simple doctrine that is in the Holy Bible rightly divided. And we saints are not assembling to exalt preachers but rather to encourage one another to continue in sound Bible doctrine. We as saints, we are not assembling to tell God the Holy Spirit what he should be doing in the present, in this present day, but rather to let God the Holy Spirit tell us what he is doing so we can by faith do that as well. My brothers and sisters, we must study God's word right to divide it so we can pray with understanding and be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherein we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, 2 Timothy 2.15 said, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly divide the word of truth. When we don't study and rightly divide the word, we eventually fall flat on our face because we'll declare God will do something that doesn't line up with what's written. We'll say something God didn't say and be left only with our words rather than his words. What is, what is written supersedes anything we see or hear, and the true words spoken by God right divided always line up with what is written so we don't go astray. Now, my wife brought something up about the importance of redeeming time when it comes to studying as we were studying together one day. She said, if we take what we do for Christ and what we do that's not of Christ. She said, if we put what we do for Christ, for the ministry and as Christ ambassadors and what we do for all other things that's not of Christ, she said the scale for Christ would be way up in the air because all the other stuff that's not of Christ has taken precedence. In other words, what are you doing with your time? That's true, my brothers and sisters. And that is and that is what we put into studying the word of truth right divided. What we what we put into it is what we'll get out of it. It's sad when we can't take the doctrine that God has given us that's designed to work effectually in our inner man and use it to comfort others as well as ourselves. Apostle Paul said. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 8, he said, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. My brothers and sisters, if you really study the contents of the, my brothers and sisters, do you have, I got to say this, do you have those words stored in your inner man that Paul is talking about here? 
in order for you to comfort others, he said, comfort others with these words. In order to comfort others, you have to know the words. You have to know the doctrine. You have to know what God is doing today. Sad occasion today in the body of Christ, the church. Yeah. What you put in is what you're going to get out. My brothers and sisters, if you really study the context of this prayer, the Our Father prayer, right divided, you will see that it neither applies to us nor describe what is God to do in this day in the dispensation of his grace. This prayer is a summary. I'm just giving you a quick synopsis of what it's all about. This prayer is a summary of Israel's prophetic program. It opens and closes with a doc, doxology. Israel praise of God. And his five petitions involve God's words to Israel. We can and do study this prayer. And we can and do rejoice in this doctrine. However, we acknowledge that it is God's word to Israel in her kingdom program. And we should not steal it and force it into our program, the dispensation of grace, or try to use it to comfort others as well as ourselves. When it comes to comforting, we need to be edifying, building up our brothers and sisters. When someone we care about is heavy hearted or our words, our carefully chosen words need to be in line with God. And what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace regarding suffering, trials, tribulation, and death. We should comfort him with the doctrine God has provided us to build us up. We should be ministering grace to them. When I needed to be comforted during times of grief over the years with what my family went through, when I needed to be comforted during times of grief and hurt, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as my family and friends, they ministered grace unto me, to me. In other words, they provided me with doctrine that would build me up and comfort me and my inner man. I could relate to the doctrine they were speaking to me because I knew the doctrine they were speaking to me. So when they told me that, God's grace is sufficient and that he's a God of all mercy and all comfort and that while outer man is perishing, our inner man is being renewed with his living word and that they gave me words of comfort that it's not goodbye to my family and loved ones as I see you again because they were in Christ. They died in Christ and they put their trust and their faith in the finished work at Calvary's cross. They were, they were used of God as a means of grace to me. Ministering to one another in time of need is an important means by which the Lord provides his grace to us. Ephesians 4.29 said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That it may minister, give grace unto the hearers. What is, what is the means of grace here? It is our words to other believers. God uses our doctrine that he has provided to us in the dispensation of grace to give grace. Are you aware that you can be a means of grace in another believer's life? That is a very sobering thought. I can impart grace to a fellow believer, but I first must know the doctrine in order to impart grace. If I don't know the doctrine and what God is doing in the dispensation of grace, how can I effectively comfort others as well as myself? Believers, we cannot fulfill any of these commands to love and comfort others if we are only concerned about ourselves and our own interests. Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Look at what it says. Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. We must realize that individually, 
We are each personally responsible for the welfare of one another. We are to look to the needs, problems, struggles of each other in this life as we deal with the sufferings of the present time, as we live God in Christ Jesus and suffer persecution, as we suffer for Christ's sake. The lack of concern that we see for each other today is nothing new. Apostle Paul talked about man's selfish, selfishness during perilous times in the dispensation of grace. Look at, look at this, Philippians 2, 19 through 22. Look at what Paul says. But I trust in the Lord Jesus sent to Matthias, Timothy, shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who would naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he has served me in the gospel with me in the gospel. This is a sad verse. Paul says in Philippians 2, 21, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters. How many are seeking their own? It's not about God, my brothers and sisters. It's not about God. So my brothers and sisters, if we look at God's word, he said they all seek their own interest. What he is saying that everybody is selfish. Paul is literally saying that apart from Timothy, that there is no other Christian upon whom he could count on at the time to care about the Philippians. Paul speaks here in the present tense. They are all continually seeking their own interest. This is strong. Paul is contrasting Timothy's concern for the Philippians with the lack of concern by others for Christ. He doesn't say that others care for themselves and not for you, but that others care for themselves and not for Christ. To be concerned for others, Christians, is to be concerned for Christ. To love Christ is to love his people. May God help us all to have the attitude of Timothy and care for each other. The Apostle Paul write that God's word we fixedly work it also in you that believe, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. When a person believes God's word, God's word will go to work in that person's life. God speaks to us through his written and preserved word, the Holy Bible. The more you study God's word and the more knowledge you gain from the scriptures, the power of God's word will be released when you believe. Have faith in it. God's word working in the believer will also produce fruit, the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23. God's power is not found in religious traditions or man's ideas. God's power is found in his word. Have faith in God's word right to divide today and it will work in your inner, in your life for his glory. Not only will you know it, but others will know it too. As we study, we make sure the basis of our faith is steadfast, stable, and firm, and that it is grounded in God's word, rightly divided. Peter specified that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, 2 Peter 1.20. My brothers, if we don't study, we'll end up relying on thoughts, opinions, and experiences Instead of understanding his word, we'll be left with private interpretation, our own unique separate views, explanation, and application of scripture. It will be about, I think, the way I see it, and I, and I, and I feel this, this means that. When we take time to digitally study, diligently study and rightly divide it, we can focus less on what we think about the passage and what we wanted to say, and more on what God meant in his word. Now, Bereans, the Bereans are a great example of studying in scripture. When Paul shared the word of truth with them, the Bible records these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so, Acts 17 and 11. Paul was certainly called and sent by God. But still, they searched the scriptures every day to see whether what he taught them was so. 
They looked into the word to confirm what someone told them because they made studying a daily habit. They dug in and they got to understand themselves and look at the results. Therefore, many of them believe also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. Acts 17, 12. As we study, we grow in faith, believing, believing the true word of God. And if someone is off and tells you something that is not so, when you study and search, you'll find that there isn't support in the word of God. So you can reject that and avoid believing a lie. Some people accept everything that is told to them, but especially in the hour we live in, that is dangerous because so many teach contradictory to contradictions to the word. Second Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto favor. When we study, believe, and love the truth, we don't ever have to believe a lie. Second Thessalonians 2, 10 through 11. And with all deceivingness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth that they might be saved. And for this call, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. It's time to study. So my brothers and sisters, God has provided us doctrine designed to effectually work in our inner man. We shouldn't allow our fears stop us from comforting others also. Let me stop and say this, and that is we can't effectively witness to others or comfort others when fear is dominating and controlling our lives. How should we as biblically sound doctrine grace believers respond when fear comes? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1, 7, many believers are plagued by unspoken fear of death. We need look at the things in light. We need to look at things in light of eternity. We have the victory over death. Many fear the things and circumstance that they can't control. Many fear what they call the unknown and the uncertain things in our life. In other words, thinking about life and trying to figure out what's around the being in life. You'll drive yourself crazy. That's why Paul told us to be anxious for nothing. In other words, what you're worrying about. Many fear the things and situations that they don't understand. Death is a promotion. Death came about because of the sin of mankind. Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all that have sinned. Instead of seeing death as the end, if you're a believer who has believed the gospel, and that is that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on the third day according to the scripture, death is, death is a departure from an imperfect and fallen world and the arrival into heaven with the Lord and all our loved ones and friends who also put their faith in the gospel, the grace of God. Therefore, the Christian believer does not need to fear death because he will be with God in heaven where everything is perfect. The Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. A discouraged, depressed Christian won't have the peace of God and won't be very productive in serving the Lord. Why? Because their fear weakens their hands in the work. If you are weak and timid, you will not speak up for the Lord as he may lead you to. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in the heart of a man brings depression. Because of this, Satan works hard in sowing seeds, words of fear to weaken and discourage the Christian. These words are spoken into our minds as the fiery dots of the enemy. Often such words come through corrupt religious teaching and counsel. We need to discern these and cast them aside casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself. In other words, elevate itself against the true knowledge of God and bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Second Corinthians 10, 5, we as humans, we are not designed to carry the burden of worry, fretting, and anxiety. 
This load is simply too much for the human body and the mind to handle. Our weak and frail bodies were not fashioned to carry pressure, stresses, anxiety, and worries. This is the reason our bodies break down when it undergoes these negative influence for too long. What the scripture advises us to do in these turbulent times or in times when others as well as ourselves need to be confident. He said, be careful. In other words, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, request, petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Notice in the above verse that we are not promised to get what we want, but rather if we pray in faith, leaving our petition with him and his will, we can have peace of mind and heart. And I guarantee you God's word will bring that tranquility to your soul. My brothers and sisters, that's what his word does. It builds us up. It comforts us. It brings us that peace, that tranquility to our souls. We can have peace of mind and heart. God's object for us to return to and abide in the peace of God without getting what we want, trusting his will in all things. The Bible does not deny that we will face adversity in his life. In fact, the Jesus guaranteed that we will face trouble. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye have, might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, in other words, oppression, but be of good cheer, he said, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. And that's where we are in tonight. And pick up next week. Let us pray. Father, here we thank you for your word. Prayers, those that listen in. We pray that they were encouraged, that they were enlightened, that they were edified in your holy scripture, right divided. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.